Good morning, Hogstein Nation. Welcome to this week's show. We finally had a quiet week here in Redskins land, but we did at least manage one big signing. I went to DC's first ever AFL game with my wife, and she was able to last the entire first half before wandering over to a bar across the street from the Verizon Center. We'll talk about it right now on the Hogstein. Welcome to the Hawks Guide, with your crew, Adam Tarasky, Alex Zeese, Sean Conti, and Steve Thomas. And now, here's your host, Sean Conti. And welcome back to this week's show. Uh, hi guys, it's uh, me, Alex, talking to you. Sean is probably still asleep, so I'm kind of <laughs> taking the hosting duties over today. With me, we have Steve Thomas. Hey, Steve, how's it going? I'm here as always. You know, I watched my first Valor game the other day, thanks to Alex's interest in it. It was very interesting, so we'll talk about that later. But I was excited about some football in D.C. again, even if it wasn't Redskins football. So that pumped me up a little bit, so I'm excited today. (laughs) Some football is better than none football, right? Um, Yeah, that's exactly right. Some football is better than zero football. Exactly. And, uh, of course, with us, we have Jamal Forrest. Jamal, hey, how are you doing? Hope you're having a nice day out there. And, uh, well, you're actually not that far from me. So I'm assuming I'm it's say, as I'm, nice I'm about 20, minute, 20 minutes away from you, man. <laughs> yeah, so I'm assuming it's as nice there as it is here. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I can't I can't complain about the weather. I was out earlier today, so I got my little workout in. I'm good for the rest of the day. Oh, yeah? I just got to, yeah, I just got to, like I told uh, Steve before the show, I just got to work on this damn senior comp and, pass this pass this test and go ahead and graduate get this undergrad over with yeah that undergrad getting that over with is always a big thing uh that last year is always i think the biggest pain of any kind of school because you it's see the, the end in sight exactly, and you're just like, it's the worst because you you know you you know you're you're so used to getting the work done mm-hmm. now it's you're at the point where it's like all right i really don't i really don't want to do this but let me go ahead and finish strong or at least do enough <laughs> where my where my GPA or my cumulative don't get messed up. So you know it's it's always it's always something that the point is that Jamal is making is that he's got a lot of graduation stuff coming up because he's a youngin and Alex and I are not youngins anymore. No, you know, so we we've all been there and, and it's an exciting time. And I do applaud you for the for the accomplishment because it's certainly a great thing. And oh yeah, it's and so you know how I, I how and, I view education as you know it's really the key to anyone's success in life. So, you know, I I think that's great that you're, you know, finishing up. You know, that's a great thing. Um, Well, let's move into the team, though. Uh, Like I said, it's kind of been a quiet week. We didn't set anything on fire, which I guess is really good news for us Redskins fans. Considering Uh, it's the Redskins, it's a miracle that we haven't set anything on fire. It's like been every week since January. Something's been burning on this team. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, But we did make one big move, and uh, this is something that, it was a little under the radar in terms of a team need, I feel like, inside linebacker. But we got a good one, I feel. I think. Uh, so well, who wants to kind of take yeah. the lead here and talk to me a little bit about Zach Brown? I mean, Zach Brown, the player, is not under the radar. But Zach Brown, the signing, was a little under the radar because I, I think he was probably behind Donta Hightower was probably the number two linebacker on, on everybody's free agent list. And we sure. definitely need one. And yeah. so he's a... He's a listen. This guy, it, it, just as an overview, to me, um, he's got a ton of speed. Mm-hmm. He's one of the fastest li- inside linebackers in the league. He's he ran a four five, basically a four five flat forty, and it shows on his game film. Right. He is not a. I, I think it's Mason Foster that needs to be worried, not Will Compton. Mm-hmm. He does not have experience. If you go back, I went and back and watched some of his game film. He's not a Mike linebacker that's calling plays. He's mostly played weak side backer. Um, he's not, because he's a speed guy. He does have some size. I mean, he's six one, about two forty five or so. Right, that's uh, good depending size. on where you look. Yeah, but but he's not a guy who you want to get engaged directly with a defensive line. His kind of mo with the way he plays is if he's on, he doesn't always line up on weak side. But when he's on weak side, he can he can stay home. You know, mm-hmm. which is a linebacker term. You guys who played understand what that means. He stays home. He can. He's really good at diagnosing the plays, and he really he has great vision. You know, and so he can he can see what's happening, and he can use his speed and athleticism to make the play. And so that's what we I see out of 
Zach Brown. And I think that for that reason, he's not going to be the Will Compton guy who's calling the plays. Uh, he's going to be the guy who uh, he's great in coverage. You know, he's going to be uh, the guy who's the drops back in coverage, plays weak side, and right. makes plays. Yeah, and uh, I think it's interesting that he kind of is looked at more of a replacement for Foster because I feel like a lot of people are happy about Foster's play. Uh, Jamal, what do you think about it, though? Uh, do you see him naturally just taking over Foster's role as just that tackle machine, or do you think he'll more likely uh, he, he will be a replacement for Compton? Well, um, see, here's the the one thing I had with that, and it wasn't it has nothing to do with Steve. It's just the opinion overall because a lot of people come to me on Twitter, you know, for these things like um, when I was thinking that Will Compton was being replaced because that's how I felt. Um, but the the thing that they were saying was, you know, same thing Steve was saying is that he, Will Compton is the play caller. Um, he's the he's the mic backer, which right. is understandable. But the thing is that I had with that, um, you know, John Conn wrote an article which stated that. There are a couple other people that's capable of calling plays for this Redskins defense. Mm-hmm. One of them is being Mason Foster. The other one, obviously, is the guy who didn't play too well in his in his uh, first his debut as a uh, starter. Um, I can't think of his name right now. Marcel Spate, sorry, but mm-hmm. you know he didn't he didn't play well in his in his debut as the Mike Backer. <laughs> but the, the 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 one thing that I had when it comes to uh, Zach Brown and Mason Foster as a as a as a duo is. If somebody is capable of calling plays, you know, we have a full offseason for somebody to, you know, take over the role of Will of Will Com- of Will Compton. Right. I'm not saying that Will and you know another thing was the the fact that obviously Will Compton was faster than Mason Foster. Well, all right, that's fine, but we've seen 16 games and let alone 2015 as well where Will Compton on on the field, you know, he's he's still not that fast. He's he's really not that fast and, you know, or mm-hmm. as fast as, as uh Zach Brown. So what are you really losing if you take Will Compton out of the lineup? A guy who struggles in traffic in the trenches, you know, he he looks to avoid the block. He looks to go around the block. He often missed tackles as well, even though he makes a lot of tackles. But you got a guy named in, in Mason Foster who's who's as who's not that fast himself, but he's physical enough to make the uh, make the play at the line of scrimmage. So yeah. for for me, I I still prefer I prefer Mason Foster and Zach Brown if those two were the if they they were around and we didn't draft the inside backer in the draft. Mm. Those are what I prefer. I understand Will Compton may be there to call plays, but I think if somebody else is capable, then uh they they should be they should be preparing for that this offseason. Yeah, let me clarify and expand uh, clarify my point and expand on what Jamal is saying cuz I don't actually disagree with you <laughs> and I don't necessarily think it has to be Will Compton to call plays. I don't think you want a rookie if they for you know like for example Hassan Reddick I feel that way too, the, yep. our mock draft. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you want Hassan Reddick calling plays immediately as a, as a rookie, but I, I think certainly Mason Foster is probably capable. I, you know, I think uh, Zach Brown's capable. There's nothing magic to call in plays. What you really want is the linebacker's physical capabilities to match the, the role more than anything to mm-hmm. me. And I think Zach Brown is not a guy you want on the strong side because you want him to be free uh, to to roam and make plays. And so that's kind of where he goes. Now right. Foster, I think maybe. Does anybody know Foster's weight straight off? Uh, I don't know it offhand, but I can look it up while you talk. Okay. And he strikes you know. me as a as a little yeah. He strikes me as a little bit bulkier maybe than Zach Brown. So I think you know to 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 Jamal's point, I wouldn't be crushed necessarily if you try to transition. Forget about Reddick for a minute. If you try to transition Foster to the strong side, leave Zach on the weak side, let Foster call the plays, mm-hmm. and then Compton becomes in you know, the rotational guy. I, that it may work. That's something they'll have to figure out in the off season. I, right. To me, it's just the key is you got to keep Zach Brown not in the box as so we don't have to think as, as, as much as a play side. caller. And by the way, well, well and also NFL look, has uh, look, him listed at two fifty. Just to answer your question. Okay, so he is a little bit bigger. Yeah, you know, and and Mark Bullock pointed this out in in the PC wrote on the inside of this week also. Um, what I saw on the all thirty two film is that. Uh, Brown gets caught when when Brown gets engaged by the defensive line quickly. Right. He tends to get caught up and kind of shuffled aside, and that's really not his strength. And so you want a guy like Foster doing that, not Brown. And plus, Brown uh, with all his speed, he actually is really good in coverage. He's the guy that's we've been missing for all these years mm-hmm. with regard yep. to tight ends running straight down the field. It's Brown that needs to be in that role. And so in that regard, you don't want Brown being 
in the Will Compton role. You just need someone to be the Will Compton role, and that sure. could be yeah. Foster. And I, I agree with that as well. I, I, I didn't get to mention, you know, the fact that he he was uh, ex- he was excellent in coverage as a as a linebacker, you know, with his speed and everything. They, they also had some clips put out on him where he was covering receivers in the slot, uh, specifically. Uh, his his one of his better matchups was against Larry Fitzgerald, who's going to be a Hall of Famer um, when his career is said and done. But, you know, he's had success against receivers in the slot. And obviously we know um, if he has to check a tight end, it wouldn't be too big of an issue for him as well. So those are one of the those are the positives when it comes to him. He's excellent uh, in pass coverage as a linebacker. And he's also physical in the run game. The one issues that people w- would point out. Um, and what's also dragged this along so much for him as far as free agency was that, you know, they they had concerns about him taking plays off as well. Um, that was something similar to, you know, what they said about Chris Baker. Uh, he mm-hmm. didn't give his full effort. But those are one of the concerns with Zach Brown is that he didn't really um, – he wasn't necessarily there every single play. So that's one of the reasons for those who are wondering why it took him so long. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we're maybe done with him at this point, but you know, there's only so much you can say. But I did see the clips where he was covering Larry Fitzgerald, you know, and and where Fitz Fitzgerald, the play I remember was Fitzgerald was on the slot on the right side. Zach Brown is on is in his linebacker spot on mm-hmm. on the Buffalo right side, yeah. and and then um, um, Fitzgerald ran sort of a square in from the slot, you know, and so that puts him straight in the backer's zone because the Buffalo Buffalo is in cover two. Sure. And and Zach covered him, you know, you know, Brown, you know, uh, Fitzgerald is not a speed guy. He's not, not a burner, but Zach no. Brown covered him up on the pattern, you know, and I can't remember, honestly, if Fitzgerald caught the ball or not, but if he did, it was a minimal, it was a minimal gain. But, so, yeah. And I, so there was another play where that's kind of like know, putting I, him ball, against a talented tight end. So that's a good. Well, sign. you know, and, and, and in terms of the tight ends, I mean, there, there's film of, you know, the tight ends releasing from the tight end spot, basically running a nine route down the field and and Brown hangs with him, you know, which is what something we've never had. Mm. So there are plays where he takes plays off. I, I think I saw that, you know, um, you know, quite honestly, every player does that to a certain extent. There's only a yeah. limited number of people who have 100 percent motor all the time. So it's a knock. But I don't know if that's I mean, the guy is a Pro Bowl linebacker. Right. The, the only well, the only guy who never takes time off unless he gets hurt is the quarterback. So, you know, everyone else s- tends to come in and out of the game. Um, you know, I, I'm excited by this. I think the one year deal is good uh, for them because I think even though I think he could be a long term answer at linebacker. You know, this gives us some flexibility to find a guy this year in the draft and, you know, not be pressured to start him. You know, we well, let's be clear about something. I want to talk about this one year, you know, because we we have a whole bunch of guys on one year. We do contracts. And this is not it's a pro team thing to a certain extent, but it's really for the player. Okay, let's be clear, because we have players on our team who are signed to three year deals, but they could be gone in year two. You know, so it's not don't I don't want people out there think, oh, it's a one year deal, you know, one year prove it deal. It's great for the team. It's not really great for the team. No, it's great for the player. You know, if it was a three year deal and Zach Brown balls out, then we'd have him locked up. Mm -hmm. And so from that respect, it's a negative, you know, so I'm not I'm I'm glad we're not tied into these guys for huge cap hits for five years. But all the same, a guy like Zach Brown, who's proven, I think I'd rather have him on a DJ Swearinger deal. Yeah, Personally. it's definitely potentially a, a dangerous situation. I remember somebody saying it actually a couple of days ago or maybe yesterday that um, we have about because of the one year deals that we've made, we have about 20, 22, 23 potential free agents next year. So yeah, we do. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a yeah, huge it's number. Pretty, and I think we're looking at another year where we'll have something like 60 million in cap space because of all this. But uh, we got to be careful. Like, you don't want to. I mean, I know they want to build through the draft, and that's part of why they don't want to sign guys to long-term deals from free agency. But you can't over-rely on building through the draft. Not yet. Okay, well, I can speak to the 2018. Um, we've got about $110 million signed up right now in cap hit, in right. cap hits for 2018. And so if the cap goes up to about 175, say, um, cause it's 166 this year. Right. And that's what so you're looking at roughly. A year. Yeah. Is you're looking at roughly 65 million mm-hmm. in cap space based on the roster we have now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't think it's terrible shape. I think there, obviously there's things they have to do like lock up Kirk and 
all that kind of well, stuff. Well, it's like another guy like Terrell Pryor. I would rather have him on a three-year deal, too. Oh, yeah. Right. I believe in Terrell Pryor's talent. You mm-hmm. know, I think that guy is a player. Uh, but understandably, you know, he wants to prove it with a guy like Kirk is going to throw for close to 5,000 yards. And then all of a sudden, Pryor's in the Pro Bowl, you right. know, and then he's got a potential for a massive deal. I mean, I see where he's coming from from his perspective. Mm-hmm. And that's probably why he was willing to come here is that the Redskins were willing to give him what he same, wanted. I mean, we, we've talked about it with Junior Gallette for years, too. Same it's well, the same. that's another matter because he's been hurt two years in a row. But, he didn't have I mean, a choice. He, it's that same perspective from <laughs> his end that I want to prove myself so I can get that big contract finally. Well, that's where it started. Yeah. You know, when he came here two years ago. I say now time's he's changed. <laughs> yeah. Now he just wants a deal, period. And if he plays well, he's going to get a multi year deal. But right. now he just wants to stay in the NFL. Yeah. 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 So um, um, I just I just had a quick question. Go uh, for just, it. just to get just to get your all opinions. Um, So. After the Zach Brown signing, which is uh, we could put it, even though it's a one year deal, it's pretty huge for our team. We know we know our needs and all this type of stuff. So sure. um, after the Zach Brown signing, like I have a question for you two. Uh, do you do you guys think, um, even though you know the it was a lot of mud, um, it was a muddy situation with the the GM firing, but just out of curiosity, do you guys think that uh, this off season has been slightly underrated due to the fact? of you know what's been going on in front office um in some respects yes yeah i think my open question for me is whether mclean and mcgee are going to improve the defensive line and if they mm-hmm. end up those guys end up end up being able to play and uh and being at least the same or better than, than baker and ricky jean francois then yeah it's those two signings that have me questioning you know, mm-hmm. and to me, it's whether uh, we've definitely improved in the secondary, right? DJ Swanger, yeah. even if he's not a perfect fit for free safety, which I don't necessarily think he is, he's a light years ahead of who, you know, yeah. the guys we had last and he, year. And he's not a bad fit at the same time. It, it, no, it's just maybe he, not his perfect strength. Yeah, but. He, he played a lot of free safety with Arizona at times. And yeah, he's probably still more of a cover strong safety type, but, you know, he can, he can cover. And that's the good thing. To me, huh? at worst, yeah, the off season has been a slight positive mm-hmm. over last year, so it's I think a little bit underrated. Um, I'm just concerned about the defensive line because I, I think we're going to lose sure. interior pass rush with those mm-hmm. two guys, McLean and Mingy. I don't think either one of them are going to be very good in pass rush. And Baker, you know, has his faults, but he was pretty decent for a interior defensive lineman in pass rush. So we're yeah. kind of losing that. They really need to draft a defensive lineman. You know, I you know whether. I mean, Adam swears there's no defensive lineman that's good enough at 17. You know, I'll take his word for it. And Malik McDowell, you know, he's got his issues. But they need to draft a defensive lineman that can start in, like, round two or three. Yeah, I I, I agree with you there. I think, uh, and you know how I've been saying we've desperately needed a nose tackle, and that's kind of where I'm looking. You know, somebody who can uh, stuff the center on runs and maybe get a little bit of interior pressure. But I I just don't know if we'll find that guy uh, at least the perfect guy for that. We, we'll find somebody, but maybe not. Well, what do you think, Jamal? Yeah. I mean, do you think it's – what do you think? You didn't give your opinion on just your own question. Oh, yeah. You, you know, I just wanted to see what y'all was thinking. But, you know, I felt uh, – I kind of felt it was actually, you know, pretty underrated in my opinion because um, the way I looked at the defensive line sign is it's not – that I thought they were upgrades per se, but I was like, um, if you if you had Chris Baker and you had Ricky Jane, uh, and obviously the the rest of the members that's that's on the defensive line who were you know just younger than those two that I just mentioned, but right. if you have those two on the off- on the defensive line who were uh, products of a of a run defense who was pretty abysmal for not only one year but a few years, um, then you know you gotta you gotta you know cut your losses per se like. Chris Baker, mm-hmm. obviously, I think the the biggest thing with with them was that um, Chris Baker was upset he didn't get a contract offer. He didn't even get an offer, so that probably was his biggest right with the Redskins. But you know, moving on from these type of guys, you know, a, a team who who really wasn't that good in the run game defensively, you know, you you move on, you just let it go, and then you build, you bring in some younger guys whose uh, whose forte, whose reputation is based is built upon being stout in the run. You have a guy named Jim Tasula and Greg Winuski, whose number one mantra is, "We're going to stop, stop the run. run. Right. We're not going to let we're not going to let anybody run against us." And so you're bringing in guys that they're comfortable with. So I'm not necessarily being <laughs> hyped on these two players, but 
I trust the coaches that are in place, and I trust the defensive line coach that's in place who has a solid reputation in the NFL that he's mm-hmm. that he gets the most out of his players. So when it comes to those two, I'm comfortable with that. Um, I'm comfortable with letting Chris Baker go. I'm obviously yeah. we know how we both, how we all three of us feel about Swearinger, Pryor, and mm-hmm. now Zach Brown. So that these are things that I'm cool with as well. So I just I just feel like it it has been underrated, and I think. Um, we still have Jay Gruden. We let Sean McVay go, but we we still have Jay Gruden, the guy who's a mastermind behind this offense. Like it's a lot of things that we were we were getting, you know, our heads wrapped around it. It was a, it was our all season was doomed from the start. But I just I just think a lot of people just <clears throat> bought bought into all the hype that was being brought on social media, and they just fed into it and fed into it. And the firing of Scott McLuhan just you know just did did everything in so. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, you know, was it, you know, like Rich, our colleague Rich wrote a column about that and said, you know, you know, basically yeah. that people need to be more positive about the season than they've been. Mm-hmm. That was sort of the point of his column. And yeah, it stinks that Scott's gone and, you know, we can, you know, beat the dead horse some more if, you know, if everybody wants to about how and why and blah, blah, blah. But point is, it hasn't been a disaster no. for sure. Right. It's been a fairly decent off season. And like you know, I gave it a slight positive, you know, pending McLean and McGee, but it's it's not been a disaster despite the fact that Scott's been gone, and that's the, a good thing. The only thing that does concern me, and we've kind of talked about this already, is the fact that so many guys are only here for another year, uh, at least yeah, in terms I of agree. contract. Um, that that concerns me quite a bit, but we'll see. You know, if Kirk can get, but you want that? You want that? You want the? The negative, the negative view of all this. Sure. You know, I'll, I'll be relentless, relentlessly negative. <laughs> Let's pretend, you know, because the Redskins have got some hard, so a hard schedule. They've got some tough games. They've got a lot of awful travel. I think we have one of the um, top ten hardest schedules at least right now. Yeah, I think we go so. to LA twice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then we go to Seattle. You know, once it's 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 tough. Mm-hmm. So let's pretend that the Redskins go six and ten. Sure. You know, which which is in the realm of possible. You know, when, it's always, you know, when you're playing it's always possible football. that you have a bad year. Well, I mean, if you know, you have four or five bad plays, and all of a sudden, game, you know, two or three games swing the other way. Right. You know, ten and six isn't too far from six and ten. <laughs> well, we've got the the quarterback on a one year deal. We've got half the offense on a one year deal. We've got some key players on defense on either one year deals or deals that they can get out of. Right. You know, I don't think if, if Dan Snyder got mad enough, I don't think he would blink twice about buying Jay Gruden out. I think you could see pretty easily a wholesale rebuild next oh, yeah. year. If things if don't things, go well, I think they could change out the entire team. I think they could change out everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think you're probably right there that if things go South, they could go South quickly. I don't necessarily think that I'm not predicting that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, the way it's set up, you could see everybody be gone. Yeah, I everybody wouldn't put it past Dan. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't put it past Dan to do that. Um, person, you know, I, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. I wouldn't put it past Dan because I don't want to say something. You know, like I I, I think that he really buys into Jay Gruden because I I felt you know I felt some things about the front office before and was dead wrong. So he might just be doing the the contract extension just to you know do some favors for some people. But sure, you know. We, we don't know how he feels, but yeah, I, I agree. I wouldn't put it past uh, Dan at all. Yeah. Well, let me get us back on track here a little bit onto our schedule that we have for today. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is continuing our look at the upcoming draft uh, with some, you know, we're going to br- look at two more positions today. Uh, we have safeties and edge rushers. Uh, so I'm going to decide to start with edge rushers, I think. You know, yeah. let, let's have some fun okay. because, to me, we talked a little bit about Galette. We this is one of the few spots on the defense that we have drafted pretty decently in the past four or five years. You know, Kerrigan, Murphy, Smith are all pretty high draft picks. Um, somewhat working out, somewhat not in a way. Uh, you know, each guy's a little unique, but. There are a lot of people who I see online who think we could go for another uh, defensive end <laughs> linebacker type player this year. They wouldn't be wrong at all. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Adam had a piece about edge rushers a while back. Uh, why don't we go through those names? And Jamal, I think you were kind of going to take the lead on this one. Yeah, 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 I will. Um, so 
essentially, you know, he stated there is a speed element missing from, you know, the Redskins' pass rushing formula. Yeah. So he took a look at five guys that would bring expos- explosiveness to the defense um, that they desperately need. So he felt all five players would be uh, uh, upgrades to the defense for Greg Minuski. And the first one he listed was Takaris McKinley, uh, college uh, was UCLA, 6'2", 250. His draft project- projection is a late first um, or a late second, or mm-hmm. well, late first between late second. So anytime, anytime between that, uh, he listed his strengths: um, explosive first step by relentless effort, making him a nightmare for an offensive tackle. Um, he likes his his uh, his hand usage. He feels like he's a solid run defender. Uh, defender, even though he's being one of the shortest edge defenders in the in the class. Uh, his weakness is he feels he's raw. Uh, mm-hmm. Must learn how to use his hands effectively, which is, um, I guess. He said he got to use it. I guess he got to use it better than what he felt that were good. So um, use his hands effectively. He needs to add more pass rush moves to his repertoire. Uh, he likes his quickness, but has to learn how to use the swim or rip move. Uh, mm-hmm. Overall, he felt he was a twitchy stand-up uh, rusher who never stops working, and that's something a lot coaches can work with. Uh, he likes the, the potential with his long arms, so he just has to use uh, the arms effectively, obviously, is what he was saying for most of the time. He felt the tack is the speed rusher that we're missing. Mm. Um, and he can learn a lot from Gillette is what he stated as well. Uh, the next yeah, one. I mean, oh, go ahead, before you go, yeah, I mean, I think McKinley, I guess Adam pretty much said this, but I think McKinley is junior Gillette light, but, mm. you know, essentially, <laughs> you know, he's got a, a, maybe a better college resume than Gillette did because McKinley's out of UCLA. But this is a guy who is pretty much, you know, he's precisely what we need. I don't think the team can count on Gallette necessarily. I mean, I hope he comes back, but he's had two Achilles yeah, in a row. It's that but we don't have. You always think he's a bonus if he comes back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you know, where where Adams coming from with all this is that um, Kerrigan isn't a speed rusher. He's kind of no. a power guy. You know, he's not a pure speed rusher, and Preston Smith certainly isn't. So nope. Dakar Smith, Smith and Murphy are kind of built the exact same way as Kerrigan if you look at them. You know, in terms yeah, of yeah. How they to play. a certain to a certain extent, at least. So Dakar's McKinley, I think. If he was available at 17 or you know, 17 in the second round, rather, you know, he might be a guy that I think would fit perfectly with mm-hmm. us. But go ahead, uh, uh, Jamal. Sorry. Sorry. So the next one he had on his list was Dwayne Smoot, uh, college from Illinois, 6'3", 265 projection between early second and mid second. Uh, mm-hmm. So his strengths were long armed pass rusher uh, with an array of move. Uh, Maria moves great hips and footwork allows him to bend the edge. Uh, he likes he uses his length, so he likes uh, obviously that to create leverage in the run game. Uh, he has a good burst off the line to go with his solid closing speed. Um, lateral quickness is a positive as well. Uh, so his weakness is he's not a great athlete. Um, still has to work on defending the run. Uh, needs to be more consistent with his hands. Uh, tends to get swallowed up by the bigger lineman. So obviously he needs more power to play with his hand in the dirt. Um, coverage skills may be a worry as well. Uh, overall, um, a prospect that he feels is a, a big draft sleeper. Um, sack production wasn't there his senior year. However, uh, the tape you uh, come to find has numerous amounts of pressures and cur- quarterback hurries. So mm-hmm. once he learns how to you know, pass rest effectively with the plan and uses his length to compliment, compliment his hands, he will excel at the next level. Mm. Um, you know, I, this guy isn't, I, I think he's more like Kerrigan Murphy and uh, Smith than is McKinley. You know, I, mm. you know, I wouldn't put us, put it past this draft anybody when you're talking about end of the second round, end of the third round, you know, fine. Right. But I don't Best know if this guy fits. Thing. Yeah. I don't know if, this guy fits the Redskins quite as well as did McKinley only because I think we have guys that are more like, that are more like smooth already. Sure. Okay. Um, so the third on his list, and this is one person that, this is one person that I've, uh, I've watched obviously because who he plays for is Tim Williams. He plays for Alabama, mm-hmm. uh, 6'3", 245, early second is the projection, uh, worst late third. His strengths is uh, a pure pass rusher. Heavy hands allows him to collapse the tackles outside shoulder and close distance on the quarterback. Loose hips and quick feet gives him the rip and bend around uh, the edge. Explosive out of his stance, despite his combine numbers. Um, 
So those are a few of his strengths. His weaknesses are there are questions on if he's a three-down player after being a pass rush specialist for most of his career at Alabama. Struggles against long-arm tackles. Uh, lacks desired arm strength and lower body strength. Uh, he can play out of control at times, leaving him susceptible to screens and misdirections. Mm-hmm. Uh, his overall thoughts is Alabama has set him up to be a solid pass rushing uh, linebacker in 3-4. His hands and explosiveness, are, explosiveness, explosiveness damn it, <laughs> are his best weapons. Uh, he'll have to show he can stop the run consistently if he hopes on being drafted before day two. Uh, some yeah. red flags off the field, plus rumors of trouble picking up the playbook at Alabama, may drop him come, uh, come draft day. So. Um, yeah, me personally, I just I feel like this is one guy because it, it fits the mold that we need. Um, we have four solid linebackers, uh, me counting Gillette being healthy this season. We have sure. four solid linebackers. You know, Tim Williams could be that specialist for us as well, um, like the same way he was in Alabama. So I, I just feel like this is one guy that I would seriously consider uh, because we wouldn't be the, we wouldn't be expecting expecting much out of him hmm. um, on the field. Now, I, um, I see Adam has him listed in the breakdown at 245, that almost seems like yeah. he's approaching that size where he could also play some inside backer for us, <laughs> at least. Well, he's a little tall for inside backer. I mean, at 245, he's not quite as bulky. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we just talked about Zach Brown. Like, Zach Brown is 6'1", 245-ish. Right. <laughs> so when you're talking about um, <clears throat> this guy, he's a little bit – I think he's not – probably not quite as bulky. To me to – me, <laughs> I think everybody knows me, and I know at least Alex knows this, is that the whole cult of Alabama thing just annoys me to no end. Sure. I can't stand it. It makes me want to dump Tuscaloosa, Alabama, into the Gulf of Mexico, basically. <laughs> well, I feel that but, way but, about the entire SEC. So, you know, I'm yeah, I do too, you. but particularly, in particular, Alabama. But I think yeah. this year's Alabama team had a defense that was unbelievable. Oh, you yeah. Know, and Tim Williams, they were legit. This is one of the few years I can say. Honestly, that even with my anti-Alabama bias, I got to give him credit. And Tim Williams was a big re- part of why they were so good. And so I think there's something to be said for a guy who played defense at that level and at that quality level rather in college. So from that respect, um, I'd give him credit. I mean, there's red flags on him, but that's why he's a third round yeah. your prospect. Well, and the red flags really do worry me. Anytime you have an SEC guy with red flags, I always feel like there's probably even more that's just getting covered up just because of it's the SEC. <laughs> you, know? you actually got a good point because yeah. um, I forgot what happened to recently, but uh, there was there was definitely some passes given <laughs> to some of these players yeah. because of who they played for. They wanted them to keep playing each week, so exactly. there definitely was some passes. I, I agree with that. Um, oh, I think so. I think you'd go on a crime spree in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and not get arrested <laughs> for it, and yeah, you're just like, hey. wear that jersey. Yeah. Did y'all hear about Deshaun getting kicked out of Deshaun Watson getting kicked out of a bar in Tuscaloosa? No, I didn't. Yeah, some players, some players, I, from what I from what I was told, um, some players were behind it, but apparently he got kicked out of a bar uh, in Tuscaloosa. Uh, for we're assuming obviously for the obvious reason he beat Alabama, but he got he got kicked out of the out of the bar just trying to get some drinks. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I saw the video of it. Uh, some like mom took it, apologizing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, was I like, mean, I'm so sorry Deshaun that that happened Deshaun to you. Didn't do anything wrong? Then no, he, he was just, just in the bar. Nah, he didn't do anything wrong. That's why it's <laughs> Alabama and Tuscaloosa specifically takes yeah. their football serious. Pretty damn serious. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think they're um, a bunch of obnoxious idiots. But go ahead. Hey, I can't blame them. That's the only that's the only sport they got. Well, the only big successful sport that they got going on right now. So, well, I mean, you know what they say, Alabama's a, you know, football team with a college attached to it, you know. Basically. <laughs> mm. All right. So, uh he has two people left. He has Jordan Willis out of Kansas State, 6'4", 255, uh draft projection mid second between mid third. Uh Strengths again, an explosive athlete with long arms, smart pl- smart player who's deliberate with his hands, hand placement. Uh, he's disciplined with his eyes and rarely out of position. Uh, he can bend uh, when he fires off the ball. Um, those are a couple of his strengths. His weaknesses are he played in a read and react scheme, so it's hard to tell what mm-hmm. he's like exploding off the ball. Tends to be late off the ball. <laughs> scheme is not helping with this, of course. Um, tight hips makes it hard for him to bend around the edge. Uh, he must win it with speed at the next level, not overly powerful unless he uses his leverage correctly. So that's a few things that are correctable. But his overall thoughts is with Willis, you're getting a great athlete with plus intangibles. He works hard and will do his best to reach his potential. He has all the tools to rush the passer. Um, 
He just needs a scheme to play to his strengths and a coach that will develop his scheme, uh, his skill set. So um, that's his fourth guy. If you guys have any thoughts on them, I have absolutely uh, you know, no it's thoughts a- on Kansas State. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this is a guy who could be a good day two pick. Sure. You know, he he's he, he's the speed. He's got the speed, and so from that respect, um, you know, it, he has value to us. Sure. He, he would fill a role on the team. Okay. Um, and lastly, Derek Rivers, uh, Derek Rivers, Youngs- Youngstown State, uh, 6'4", 250. Uh, draft projection between mid-third, mid-fourth. Uh, he is a sp- uh, motor guy with a great punch, Can uh, has a great burst off the line with the ability to dip around the edge, uh, turn speed into power if he gets off the ball, good lateral ability, makes him a weapon over uh, – all over the front, so sorry. Uh, he's a disciplined round defender, defender as well with solid footwork. Uh, his weakness is uh, level of competition being the main flag, but he played at a high-level FCS uh, talent, so uh, he needs to add lower body strength to be more effective setting the edge. He has trouble uh, stacking, shedding linemen. Uh, he needs to counter his initial pass rush and disengage sooner. So he would like to see him play a little bit with more aggression um, mm. is what he's saying. Uh, and he also must add multiple pass rush moves before he can be a full-time rusher in the NFL. Overall thoughts, uh, River is a guy who won with his effort and natural ac- athleticism in college. Uh, he must learn the nuances of a pass rushing to be successful at the next level. Doesn't have elite arm strength, but uh, his hand placement will be key moving forward. So he likes him as a situ- situational pass rusher mm-hmm. immediately with growth potential to be an every-down player by his second contract. So about four or five years into his uh, career. I can honestly say that absent Derek Rivers' appearance on Adam's uh, draft preview site, I have never heard the name Derek Rivers. <laughs> I've nope. never seen him on film. I don't know a single thing about him. Um, just based on what I read here, and you know, when we did this, you know, it's the Youngstown State thing that's the major red flag to me. You know, mm-hmm. you just don't know how a guy like that is really going to show up in the NFL. And some, some of them have been great. You know, obviously, I mean. You know, London Fletcher, you know, D3 school, you know, great player, borderline Hall of Famer, blah, blah, blah. So uh, this is a, you know, yeah, Pierre Garçon. If you drafted Derek Rivers, you sort of have to, as a fan, you have to trust that the scouts and the coaches saw their film and liked him. Because this is just a guy that the three of us here are never going to be able to, Mm -hmm. you know, give you a whole heck of a lot of insight into Derek Rivers. Now, there's one name that Adam didn't have on his list, but I want to bring it up anyway because we met with this guy. Or the Redskins met with this guy. Uh, yeah, we didn't meet with him. <laughs> no, we don't meet with anybody. I, I, I'm using me, we as in we are fans of the Redskins, so it's all us. We're all in this together. Um, but and that's T.J. Watt. Um, obviously, the brother of the best defensive player in the NFL. Uh, so I think he's getting a lot of run because of that. T.J. Watt for the Houston Texans. Yes. Um. But the team met with him. I think it was l- this week or last week. Uh, they had a play. Yeah, I mean, TJ Watt is a round two to round three kind of pick, right? You know, obviously the Redskins like him. You know, is he quite as good as JJ, his brother? Probably no. not. He Different doesn't position have JJ too. Watt's size. Different position. Um, you know, he's a guy who, you know, his brother's so good that somebody's going to take a flyer on him and probably boost his value just for that reason alone. Right. You know, we'll just have to see how he turns out. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. I- I'll um, be interested to see if he- he's part of, uh, you know, the Redskins plans. Uh, yeah, let's move on to safeties. Um, you know, this is, I think, at the beginning of the year, this was probably the number two position of need for me, safety. But now that we added Swearinger, oh, yeah. it drops down a little in my book. But I, I still could see the Redskins targeting a safety because this is a draft that is really deep with good safeties. So with that. Um, yeah, it is. It, and, and, and Adam has published a piece. This was uh, back in February on safeties. The, the number one guy on the list, on his list, is Jabril Peppers. Um, Jabril Peppers blew everybody away at the combine. Mm-hmm. He's got a big personality. You know, and, and he talks a lot, talks a lot of trash, thinks highly of himself, you know, to his credit. Um, he's a world-class athlete, tremendous right. athlete, and that's his – and because of that, he's versatile. Now, now, Adam wrote in the piece about, you know, there were rumors he was going to run a 4-3-40. He didn't run that. He ran a 4-4-40 at the combine, so he wasn't quite as fast. But that's still ridiculously um, good. 
you know, you know the, yeah, it's pretty good. It's well, it's it's fast, it's fast, but but Adam's point in the piece was that if he's that fast, maybe he can be a true free safety mm-hmm. because he didn't play. He wasn't really a true free safety in college. He was, um, you know, he, he his um, his inter- he I think he only had one or two interceptions in, in college. Mm-hmm. Don't quote, don't hold me to the number, but he had very few interceptions. He's really and truly probably more of a strong safety type you know as as adam says he's raw in deep coverage i don't think you draft a jabril peppers and throw him out there to be a true free safety in a cover three day one so if you guys out there think that that's probably not what you're getting with jabril Pe- jabril, jabril peppers is sue cravens plus that's who right. jabril peppers is well he's a me. better athlete but i think cravens is probably a bit more they have different skill sets cravens is bigger Craven's a little bigger, but yeah. I think they, they they kind of fill the same role. Exactly. Um, you know, yeah, now Adam that. says he saw – yeah, Adam, when Adam wrote this, he said he saw him playing free safety in Minuski's defense. Not saying Adam's wrong, um, but the speed was a tiny bit lower than what was projected back when we wrote this. Sure. So, what do you, Jamal, do you have any comments? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, the one thing well, I was going to say is don't – wasn't he a linebacker at points in college? Is yes. that right? Yes. Yeah, he yeah, played so. linebacker, safety. I think he played slot corner, too, as one, at one point, oh, if I'm okay. not mistaken. The, the, that's the one thing we desperately do need is a real slot corner. But I don't know if you draft That's not guy. why you draft Jabril Peppers to be your slot corner. No, you don't draft a guy in the first round for that role, do you? And you nope. don't draft Jabril Peppers in particular for that role. Yeah, yeah well, me personally, I when it comes to Peppers, you know, I the only thing that I, that I see in him – to an extent, is uh, I, I would say Ty, Tyron Matthew. Um, but I mean this in a way that he's he was a playmaker all over the field defensively for um for Michigan. And the thing is, uh, and not even just not even defensively, but you know he he did a lot of things offensively and he did things on special teams. So he was a guy who's definitely a playmaker. And those type of things won't stop when you get to the NFL. The question is. What position do you really want him to play? Because we don't know where he's going to thrive at defensively in the NFL. Mm-hmm. And he may be – like, he's fast enough, and he's he has a lot of uh, smarts to play on the offensive side as well. So what do you really want to do with a guy uh, in Jabril Peppers? And I think that um, if you do have him at safety, it may he may have a, a steep learning curve, but at the same time, he does have some tie Ryan in him. Mm-hmm. It's, just, it's, just, it's just who's going to get that out of him, in my opinion. I think Tyran's probably more of a playmaker than Peppers. <clears throat> um, Which is fair. You know, was yeah. You know, Tyran was a, a was a Heisman candidate, and if he had, you know, Tyran had his drug problem. If he hadn't had that, I think he would have been a much bigger deal in the draft. But yeah, um, I, to me, I don't think the Redskins draft Peppers. <clears throat> excuse me, just because you know we, we've got. I, I think Swearinger and Sua Cravens. Both of them have uh, similar qualities to him, and I don't think Peppers is great. And you know, and he's fun to watch. He's fun, you know. He's fun. Whatever to watch team play does football. get him, will be very lucky to have him. I think. Yeah, but I don't know if he fits the Redskins as well as Buda Baker, who's the next guy on the list. Sure, Buda Baker. Um, and then for those of you asking, you know, we did include him in our second round mock draft last week. A couple people asked why, and the reason was we didn't think he'd be available. At seventeen in round two, right. he's five ten, one eighty out of Washington. Oh my goodness, and that, only one eighty. Yeah, and that's his knock. He was supposed to be a little bit bigger than that, uh, but it, but that's what you know. That's what he measures out at. So that's his obvious weakness. But he's, uh, you know, he is what Adam says about him. You know, he's a force in the run game, rare mm-hmm. blend of closing speed instincts, fundamentally sound. His primary weakness is his size, and when he when he's that small, I mean, we've got. You know, Terrell Pryor is, you know, seven inches taller, for example. Right. So it's tough for him to engage wide receivers at that size. Um, <clears throat> I think Buddha is much more of a true free safety just by his skill set mm-hmm. than is Jabril Peppers. And so if I if you gave me true serum and wanted me to draft one or the other, I'd probably draft Buddha just for that reason. Um, that having been said, you know, Adam maintained when we wrote this and maintains to this day that he's not going to be there at 17. <laughs> Um, you know, so it may be a fruitless. fruitless At seventeen, or do you mean part. in the second round? Seventeen in the second round. Yeah, oh, okay. he, I so think he will be there if we want him in the first round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I misspoke. I was yeah. meaning seventeen, the seventeen slot in in the in round two, which I believe is forty nine. Right. Dude, and, I wouldn't even take him in the first though. I well, wouldn't. I would. 
I, I, I do know, like, safety, at least at one point for me, was high enough where I would at least have considered it. Um, it you know, I, maybe not him. You know, if somehow, like, Hooker or one of those other big, super big name free safeties. Hooker or Adams. Yeah, if they dropped, yeah, I would I, do it. I didn't include but... Hooker and Adams on this thing just because it was... We're not getting them, but yeah, those two guys are the, by the number time we one draft in the first round. Probably those two guys are the by far the the two top safety prospects, right. Hooker and Adams. Right, and I would take one so, of them in a heartbeat. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I yeah. just didn't want you guys to think we were just skip. We missed them. We skipped them intentionally. Right, we we skip certain people intentionally. <laughs> it's more we tried to, when we asked Adam to do this. We said who's feasible for us. Right. So so Jamal, what do you think about Buddha Baker? I haven't heard you. Wait. Um. Well, me personally, I, I do like his his range. Um, mm-hmm. I, from what I've seen in in uh, Washington, I do like his range, and it's impressive because this is a guy where you know he's played the position already, um, as opposed to um, well, we we have mixed feelings on Swearinger, and then obviously we know that uh, Jabril Peppers is a guy who we don't we have questions about as well as playing the free pre position. So when it comes to Baker, I do like the fact that he has the range, but when it comes to the pros, I just I really didn't. Till now, I, that's why I was so shocked. I really didn't know he was only 180. I really don't trust that. And I could, I would, I would have liked to make a comp about Earl, um, Earl Thomas, but Earl is like 205, maybe 210, I think, and he's still moving as fast as Buddha. So, um, I, I like him. Um, I just hope if we were to get him, you know, he's he's able to bulk up while keeping some speed on him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the next guy, Justin Evans, has a similar problem. He's six one, but he's only 195. And so it's got that same kind of a little bit lanky frame. Um, he's out of Texas A&M, but Adam projected him out was late first to late second round. He's another guy who's a true free safety, though. Right. So the Redskins wouldn't do bad by having a Justin Evans. Uh, you know, if he's there at 17, um, I can't remember if we put him in our mock draft choice or not. But the, you know, the Redskins wouldn't. I can't. Yeah, I don't think so. But uh, he's another guy that point is might be good. Um um, weakness, you know, he's very aggressive. And so when you have, we've had aggressive safeties and corners on this team and sometimes aggressive safeties result in touchdowns, Right. you know? And so, and so <laughs> rookies who come in or ultra aggressive in college don't necessarily have the athleticism advantage that they had in the end of, in college. And so right. those are the guys that have a learning curve to a certain extent. And Evans may be one of those guys. Um, Adam says, um, that Evans may be a guy to draft in the 20 to 25 range in the first. Um, so he likes him, uh, but that is Evans. So we, we could do worse than a Justin Evans. No, we, there, there's, I mean, it's such a need. We haven't drafted a free safety in so long. I, I would, I don't yeah. think any of us would be disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be disappointed with Evans personally. Marcus. Yeah. Marcus may another one. Marcus may was on our mock draft poll and we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, you know, for for uh, round three, which we did this week, he's six six foot even, two fifteen, so he's a little bit bulkier out of Florida. Um, rangy tackler, great blocker, shredder, strong ball skills, great instincts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, weaknesses may not be a free safety. He may be a tweener. He's a little bit bulky. You know, so he may be more of a strong safety. Um, but nonetheless, you know, quality player. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, Desmond King, next guy, last guy on our list, uh, 5'10", 205. So he's a little bit bulkier than Evans and Buddha. Um, very smart. He's got physical limitations with athletic ability. Um, you know, he doesn't have ideal height, you know, doesn't have ideal speed, No. but you're talking about a day two player here. So this guy is one of Scott McGloin's classic football player types. And so that's, you know, if you see him taken in the mid mid rounds, it's because he's got great instincts, just kind of lacking in athleticism. So, unless that is those are that's our safety preview. Unless you guys have something to add, no. Uh, yeah, I got one thing to add. Okay. Just uh, I was surprised because I, I looked at this a couple times uh, earlier when he when he first released it, but I was kind of surprised. And I don't want to butcher the man's name because um, I. I really Talking don't have practice. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but the, the guy <laughs> out of UConn, OB. you guys know who he's talking about. Ob. <laughs> the safety yeah. out of UConn. Ob. Uh, last last name starts with an M. He's like six four, runs a four four. Um, and this is one guy that I was really surprised that he didn't write about because, um, at the at the Senior Bowl, this is where my eyes first turned turned to uh turned to him where I saw literally every single rep. He was 
he was lock, he was putting the seatbelts on any receiver that was stepping in front of him. And the and the one on one drills at the goal line, you know, it was something that was it looked so easy for him. And I felt like he was getting a lot of hype, and it was well deserved. He was rising, he was rising up in in the draft boards for a lot of teams. And mm-hmm. at the combine, his numbers even showed out as well. A lot of knocks from what I'm hearing is that. Uh, his tape doesn't show what his what his combine results, uh, you know, were. The tape doesn't match what what they saw at the combine. So that's one thing. And on top of that, he played with UConn. But I just don't I don't feel that um, I don't feel that that which would be a serious issue with him because I seen the cup. Co- he was covering some of the best at the Senior Bowl. Like if if that's good enough, and he was, you know, I I just feel like he was something that that's worth talking about. So yeah. um, if I saw him cover the best at the Senior Bowl, then. I I would like to believe that he's capable of doing that at the next level as well. And I think this and, and go with, him pretty hard lately. Well, and uh, he, he actually took a private, Well, he's also met with Dallas and the Eagles, by the way. We're going to go with Obi Melifonwu. Melifonwu? Yeah, fairly. Yeah, Mel, no, it's Melifonwu. It's M E L I F O N W U. So if you're out there, Obi, we're sorry for butchering your name. Okay. That's how you pronounce it. But yeah, the Eagles and Dallas have both met, have both met with him. So that, that, that doesn't make me happy. <laughs> okay, so he he's definitely tracking with the East. It sounds like yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I you know I I definitely think safety is going to be a need. If we don't draft a safety, I'll be shocked. I just don't know what round anymore. Right. Um. Speaking of rounds, and you kind of talked about it. Round three of our listener mock draft was this week. Uh, yes, we've had fun. With, we've had fun with this for the last three weeks. Yep. Um, we did Malik, We did round one three weeks ago, and Hassan Reddick, the linebacker out of Temple, who's Alex's boy, won that. And so under our hypothetical, Hassan Reddick is a redskin. Last week, um, Joe Mixon, the running back from Oklahoma, won. Mm-hmm. And so under this hypothetical, we have Reddick and we have Mixon. And so the question then is, knowing that, who would the Redskins draft in round three? And because we only can put four slots on the stupid Twitter poll, um, we pick, came up with Dorian Johnson, the guard out of Pitt. Uh, Jaleel Johnson, the defensive lineman out of Iowa. Johnson, Marcus Johnson. May, the, Johnson, Johnson. Marcus May, the safety out of Florida, the aforementioned May. And Nate Peterman, the quarterback out of Pitt. Now, um, we did these choices for a reason real quick. You know, Johnson is the guard. We've put guards, people, in these polls three weeks in a row now. You guys just don't seem to want to draft a guard, so we want to do that again. Nope. Um, Johnson is the D lineman. Uh, May, obviously, the safety. And we included Nate Peterman primarily as a nod to Mark Bullock, who brought him, who mentioned him in a column that he may be a good mid round pick if the Redskins want to protect against Kirk Cousins' possible departure right. and who would be a good replacement. And that's Peterman. He, and he, he also may be a, supposedly had the best senior bowl of any quarterback. Um, yeah. And so we threw work. Peterman out there. I've seen him anywhere from second to fourth round. We threw him out there because this is the last week we're doing this. Yeah, so. we're not. We, um, we so don't expect our listeners to do a, all seven rounds in this. I think that would be a little <laughs> absurd. <laughs> but we, yeah, it would be absurd. So knowing that, so we have Johnson, Johnson, May and Peterman. Mm-hmm. As always, I always ask you guys, uh, who do you think the public would have voted for? Now, we're going to start with Alex because Jamal has gets these right, you know, and so we're going to see oh, you if already Alex, know. <laughs> so, Alex, who do you think the public would have selected? Well, I poll? think the public probably went with the defensive linemen uh, because we all know how desperate we are. I would actually wildcard it and go with the quarterback, though, personally. Um, I okay. think, you know, Colt's a nice person to have, but I don't see him as any kind of long-term answer. Even as a backup, he's 30. You know, like, I, I don't see him sticking around forever. So I think getting a guy like Peterman who you can groom to be even a backup is actually a pretty smart and as move. We, and as we all know, Nate Sudfeld robbed Alex's house, and so Alex hates him <laughs> and thinks he's a worthless human being and a terrible person. And so yeah, that's why. Exactly. So, Jamal, what do you think? Uh, I think – so we got Riddick in the first and we got Mixon in the second. I think they're staying on defense um, because obviously we know that we don't have – uh, an impact guy at defensive line, so the more the merrier. And mm. they chose uh, the guy out of Iowa, Jillo Johnson. Yeah, Johnson. well, it turns out for maybe the first time since we've ever done these polls, you guys both got them right. Right, the public did in fact select Jillo uh, Johnson at to the tune of forty six percent. Um. Personally, yeah, I would have picked him too because we just desperately need a need a yeah. defensive and he's actually, lineman. He's I know not some bad. Be- I just. <laughs> 
He's some people are down. Like, like Steve Soup, for, I think, from Fanspeak, I think it was, it was down on him. We had a Twitter conversation about it. It might not have been him, but um, some people think his athleticism, you know, isn't there. But mm-hmm. I, he's a need, and I definitely would have picked him. <laughs> um, second place was Marcus May, the safety out of Florida. Um, this is also a need pick, you know, because everybody knows we need safeties. Sure. 13% uh pick Dorian Johnson the guard out of pit um and coming last the the very the the not smart few who stupidly picked a quarterback because it's <laughs> just a horrible it's a dumb thing to do and Alex is crazy uh Peterman got 12%. So it went Jaleel Johnson, Marcus May, Dorian Johnson and Peterman. And so, this one unlike last week, this one wasn't even really close. No, it wasn't. It was, yeah, it was. Um, last week was super close. Yeah. I'm about to say, what was it? Because I know Mixon won, but who was uh, who came in second? By, oh Mix, God, Mixon won by one percent. Like, it, okay, yeah. all right, we'll to, just leave it there. I don't, I don't need you to go back and look, Steve. I'd have to go find it. <laughs> it was, I, I it was it a defensive away. lineman. I can't remember what who who it was, but okay. I'd have to go dig it out. Yeah. Um, so anyway, was it so that was, uh, It might have been. It might have been more. It was okay. one of it was it Wormley or um. I don't hold me to that, but it was it was the defensive lineman came in second. Yeah. All right, I so that is concludes our mock draft for 2017. Right. We will come up with another poll of some other topic that we dream up for next week. But in our mock draft, it went Hassan Reddick, Joe Mixon, and Jewel Johnson. So I think you guys did a pretty good job uh, in filling some needs. Yeah, I, I think um, that would be actually be a pretty good first three rounds, don't yeah. you? Like if we can. I, I mean, with the that. Mixon thing. We talked about Mixon, and there's all sorts of. I didn't, we didn't get Jamal's opinion on Mixon. I don't mean from a playing standpoint. You know, he's got the the assault charge. We talked about it last week, so don't spend too much time on it. But what do you? Yeah, I know you commented on Twitter and said that you would have no problem drafting Mixon. So what do you think, given his yeah. background? I mean, overall, I just wouldn't have a problem with it because, um, you know, first and foremost, he made a mistake, uh, and everybody's. I shouldn't say to that capacity, but everybody obviously makes mistakes and they're entitled to second chances. Um, it just depends on what you do and how you respond to that, you know, that that mistake that you made and in what capacity it was. You know, he served his time. He got his he got his he served his time in terms of suspension. He was suspended for a full season. Uh, he hasn't had an incident since. Um, I think the video uh, and I'm not. I'm not, you know, downplaying the incident itself, but I think the video uh, definitely opened everybody's eyes and obviously put the violent perspective to, you know, hit the situation out there and made everybody aware of it. So um, obviously it's going to be a lot of strong opinions on it. But overall, you know, if he gets drafted by us, that's fine. Um, I, I think that from what's been shown, he's capable of, you know, just keeping his head up and, and staying headstrong and being smart about situations in the in the, uh, in the future. So I'm not I'm not opposed to it. Uh, I'm more opposed to the uh, the the scouting the scouting report that's been out on him in terms of on the field so mm. um that's that's basically what and scouting reports have strengths and weaknesses so it's it's meant to you know make you stray away from them if you if you buy too much into the weaknesses so but yeah. it it was the scouting report that that kind of made me say well okay maybe we don't really need to get them so mm. there you go fair so enough I was just curious I didn't mean to drew derail the train but no no, no, no I was no, just curious fine. Jamal's been it, it you know it. It is a major topic when it comes to mixing, you know. Yeah, it is. Like, and yeah, everyone should, you know, be aware of it. it Definitely. Yep. And, and before you go on to the next topic, because I know we're, you know, we're going to talk about your Valor stuff. Since I did this, I wanted to get this information out here real fast. I was bored at lunch. And so given we talked about a month ago, maybe, about how the Redskins have drafted fewer defensive linemen than any recently in any other team in the NFL. So I wanted yeah. to go back and see really what the truth was in terms of what we drafted. So I went back and I counted manually. Uh, all of our picks from rounds one, two, and three back to 1992 by position group. And then I did the same thing for the Dan Snyder era, which was 2000 to 2016. So I'm not going to read every category here, but suffice to say, from 19, from in the Dan Snyder era, um, aside from punter and kicker, we have drafted um, fewer defensive linemen than any other position group. It's actually tied with running back. We've drafted mm. two defensive linemen, two running backs in rounds one, two, and three since 2000. We've drafted, on the other end of the spectrum, seven wide receivers, seven corners, three safeties, so 10 defensive wow. backs, seven wide receivers, and then we've drafted eight uh, eight offensive linemen total. And so that kind of tracks is what we think, which is 
you know, the Redskins like to flash mm-hmm. the players. They like the wide receivers. You know, they, they have this abnormal fascination with drafting secondary. You know, they've drafted a ton of them. We've ignored defensive line. It's not a fallacy to say we have totally ignored the defensive line. We're not making this up. I just proved it to you. We've drafted two defensive linemen in the top three rounds since 2000. And if you go all the way back to 1992, we've drafted only four defensive linemen in the top three rounds since mm-hmm. 1992. And of those four, none of them, you know, none of them, um, uh, Trent, um, none of them made it. You know, it's Kennard Lang and a couple of, I can't remember the names. Yeah. Um, a, uh, well, we had that one guy in the supplemental draft. Uh, was it? Jar, 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 Jarvis uh, Jenkins. Jarman. Jeremy, Jar, no, Jeremy, Jeremy Jarman. Jarman. Yeah, you. so Jarvis Jenkins is another one. So that's three. So it was yeah. Kennard Lang, uh, Jarvis Jenkins, and Jeremy Jarman. All, none of those three guys Busto. ultimately made it. Yeah. Now, we've drafted 10 wide receivers. Which 10 that actually surprised me. I didn't know it was that many. We drafted yeah, me neither. All, you know, all the time. We draft a ton of them. So there you go. I just wanted to get that out there. Um, I may write a post about this later. I, think I don't you want to should. spend too much time. I think that's uh, interesting, some interesting numbers to talk about. I, it may, yeah, you may read about it in a column because it's kind of getting lost on the air when I just start chugging numbers out like that. Yeah, yeah. No, but I think I think that would be an interesting thing to discuss yeah. in a post. Um, I will save my notes and maybe turn it into a post. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And we all know you love to post about numbers anyway. You know, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that was an excellent piece on Kirk, though. Yeah, yeah, it was well, pretty good. It's not a good Steve article unless there's at least three tables. That's what I always say. I've well, always it has said to be. It, it, I'm not really trying hard if I don't hit two thousand words. <laughs> exactly. I'm about to say it has to be. It has to be a limit of. I mean, a max of uh, at least at least uh, fifteen hundred, maybe seventeen hundred. Yeah. yeah. So, See, if he's I, over I, that, then he's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the cousins thing. I was serious about it. I mean. You know, if you get to, you know, five years, 130 and get him more money than he would get in the first two years from the tags, I think sure. you got a reasonable shot at getting him signed. You know, that was the whole point of it. I get and it. And I went, I asked, um, I saw you, Joel Corey about I it, saw a couple that. other you, draft You messaged guys it to Joel Corey, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I just wanted to get his, in, in, I, I messaged it to a couple guys and they said that it was sort of in the right track. They, their opinions of it were that I had my guarantee was a little low, total guarantees. Mm. I acknowledged that in the column actually, and said, "Don't be surprised if the Redskins guarantee at least a portion of Kirk's year three salary." Mm-hmm. And so that was the difference. And I just didn't, as kind of a nod to let's be team friendly. Their opinion yeah. of it was, you know, you may need to guarantee at least a part of year three, and mm. if you do that, then my number is probably right there. So yeah, okay. So there you go. Well. <clears throat> Yeah, and that that you know, like I said, you you love your tables, it, and I think it it actually is fun. It's fun in a way. I, I'm a nerdy guy. I I've like numbers. Tortured too. Alex tables with tables now for years, trying to get them posted in the manner that they look right. Yeah, <laughs> but now with the new system, you do it yourself, which makes my life so and much it, easier. And it makes my life such a pain. I hate it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right. Well, speaking of making people's lives a pain, I want to talk about the Washington Valor. Because last night was game number one, um, and it you know what I went, I, I dragged my wife and a couple friends along. My wife, like I said, she was able to save for about the first half and then wandered off because she got bored. Um, not, a not a football not. fan, and I I don't know if I mentioned this at the top of the show, but my wife was like they should just play six man football, and I was really proud that my wife knows what six man <laughs> football is because a lot Probably of people nobody don't. listening to this knows what it is. <laughs> right, exactly. It's it's really like a rural Texas thing, but my wife went to high school in rural <clears throat> Texas, so that's why she knows. Um. Anyway, let me get back to the Valor game. First off, the crowd was amazing. Um, there were more people than I expected. They they had said they were expecting ten thousand, and they got fifteen. So that was really yeah. good, you know. Sometimes when you're at Wizards games, it looks emptier than that. So yeah, I, I saw the people taking the pictures online, um, and I saw some a couple that you posted too. It was pretty. It looked pretty packed in there. Yeah, it was. It was. There was a good crowd. Um, the game itself was very fun. The Valor, uh, they scored early and often in the first half. They put up thirty six points, I believe, in the first half. Thirty four. Thirty four. Thirty four points. Um. They, their very first touchdown fittingly went to a guy named Washington. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, if you want a jersey, get that jersey. You know, it'll last you for a long time. You know, a jersey <laughs> with the name Washington on the back. <laughs> I've always said that about the Redskins, too. Everyone should just get like the Marcus Washington jerseys. 
you know. And like, we'd we'd like to, by the way, thank the Valor for inviting us and allowing us that's to true. be. I was already a season ticket holder, either. but they've <laughs> yeah. been great to us. Um, yeah, their PR staff is excellent. <clears throat> They recognize people – like when I wandered over, they're like, hey, Alex, how are you doing? You know, they were very friendly. Um, you know, I don't expect them to know my name. I, <laughs> I, I still consider myself a nobody, but <laughs> – So do we. Are you yeah. moving up there, man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they were very nice. My friends enjoyed themselves. I enjoyed myself. Um, we have a good team too. Uh, the defense is really all based on our safety who uh, he's a local boy. I've mentioned him before, and you know you I played him in the interview, um, yeah. Tracy Belton, and he had two interceptions in the first half. So you know he had himself a good game, <clears throat> and you know arena football is all about one or two defensive stops, and he did it. So that was let re- me, it was really cool. Let me say this, uh, Jamal. You haven't been subject to this, but Sean and I have been. Subject to Alex's babbling about the Arena Football League for years now, and it's at times made me want to scratch my eyes out. That's fair. I was not, I watched last night. I watched the Valor the Valor Brigade. They played the Baltimore Brigade, right? And I watched this game, and this was the first uh, more than five second clip of Arena Football I've ever seen in my entire life. And I gotta oh, wow. say, it was, I've never watched Arena Football ever. <laughs> And it was a lot of fun, and it was much more fun than I thought it would be. I enjoyed the game. I think that it's a completely different style of football. Right. I was shocked to see that there was a receiver running forward motion at full throttle, and that somehow that's not a penalty. You know, I wasn't used to that. Right. They took that from the um, CFL or the CFL. I, yeah. Thing. I wasn't ready for that. It's a completely different game, but it's a lot of fun to watch. I turned the game on. You know, I first started watching at halftime because uh, I was out. It was 34 to 6. I thought, well, you know, let me watch it because I know we have to talk about it, but it's a blowout. Turns out it wasn't a blowout. Yeah, it came, came back. back. Right. So, Yes, it was a lot of fun to watch. I highly recommend everybody watch it. And there's one, the most important reason why everybody needs to watch this. This quarterback, Myers, has got the greatest mustache in the history of humanity. Oh, yeah. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Yeah, it doesn't. He's got the, like, pepper, the salt pepper hair now because he's, I think, 34. He looks like he's much older. He's got that Kurt Warner grizzled veteran vibe going. Uh, He's he's got a mustache. It's just unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's. It's it's in thickness and in you know the location <laughs> on his face. You know we can break it down. It is the greatest mustache oh, I have ever man. seen. I, I think oh, his mustache might have to be the uh, photo that I throw up for the show. Yeah, it's 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 the mustache episode, people. Yeah. yeah. Oh my. Um, you know I'm a little bit surprised that uh, that you really haven't watched that much. Well, I, I, all right. So for me, I, don't I, like I East Coast, remember. All right, I'm gonna say for me because um. I actually started, and I, I found it by accident, but I actually started watching AFL like when I was probably like seven or eight years old when I was just scrolling. Because all I did when I was younger, when I was at other people's house, was trying to find ESPN. And, yeah. you know, I'd, I'd see this football league on in the summertime. I'm like, hold up, this ain't the NFL, but it's football. So I just start watching it. Um, I'm not a huge fan, but at the same time, I I am a, a person who, if I can find the games on, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll watch them. So uh, it is something that's interesting because I just like the way they the the, the fast pace and they score a lot. So yeah, um, it's just it's the, the many different ways to score. Um, and mm-hmm. obviously the field goal kicking uh, is is pretty difficult, or it looks like it's pretty difficult. So it is. It's, yeah. yeah, it's just a lot of things that I'm I'm interested in. I didn't get to watch the game like I thought I was that I that I thought I was going to be uh, doing yesterday. I saw like probably like the last five minutes of the second quarter. Mm. So um, and then after that, I I forgot what happened. I, I don't remember. Um, well, but... uh, let me say this about it. Also, is is to relate this back to the Redskins. You know, Jay Gruden, as as we know, is famously a, a Arena Football League quarterback. He was and an coach. Arena Football League coach. Yeah. I was stunned, stunned at how very similar the Arena League offense that the Valor was running looked like what Jay does. Mm-hmm. It really you can really see now why Jay is who Jay is in terms of football. His arena league roots, you know, it's it's really quick release. You know, the, the right. quarterbacks are getting rid of the ball in a second, you know, yeah. maybe. Lots of short passes, lots of yak. It's exactly what Jay runs now on a bigger field. I'm right. say, so, well, kudos to him be able to have uh, so much success um in the NFL, you know, another league where, you know, the AFL is just Obviously, it's just two different leagues, so kudos to him. Well, 
Well, and I wrote a post about this. <clears throat> uh, you know, what last year was it, Alex? Uh, it might have been two years ago. <laughs> Might have been it where I went back and, and researched the history of every single coach in the NFL head coach and did a and there's lots of tables in that one. Tons yeah. of tables. And as it turns out, as Jake Gruden's background is singularly unique in the NFL, mm-hmm. there's no other coach that spent his that amount of time in the arena football league. You know, and so it really is kudos that he was able to translate that offense into something that works in the NFL. In all seriousness, yeah. I give Jay credit for it. And I, I, hey, I, I, I like you said about the quarterbacks. This is such a quick game, and I, I think that is really where you – it's not so much the passing tree. The passing tree has to evolve from the AFL to the NFL a bit for Gruden. Yeah. But the yeah. way quarterbacks play, the way they move their feet, the way they get out of the pocket when it breaks down, you you could put Kirk Cousins in there and <laughs> switch him out with Eric Meyer or some of these other guys who have been playing the AFL for years, and right. the way they play is identical. Like that Alex- is what Gruden's looking for. How many uh, teams in the AFL now? Because I know a few dip. So how many teams are in the NFL? Right now in the it's AFL? five. Uh, There's only five teams in the AFL. Yeah, yeah. They lost uh, the entire West Coast, which was L.A., uh, Portland, and Arizona all dropped out last year. And then wow. uh, D.C. came in. That added two uh, with D.C. and Baltimore. <clears throat> Basically what happened, and I wrote a whole article uh, about what, where the AFL is going on our website yeah i'm gonna check yeah. i'm gonna check that out Dan. it's on our website but uh long story short they're kind of remodeling themselves where they want just nba or nhl owners and a lot no more of the gene simmons owning a football team nonsense because la kiss yeah so that's why there's only five it. teams yeah there were a lot of teams that it looks like the owners the rent on renting a stadium is insane steve could probably m- might know a little bit about that um, well, at the general gist of it is, yeah. <laughs> number one, an arena league team isn't going to fill a stadium. They're going to no. fill an arena. But but these arena league teams are not the primary tenant in any of these arenas. Right. <laughs> and so if you have ownership that is not common, I've been, I've guys, I've been, I've sat in the room for these negotiate, participated in these negotiations. Um, you know, and, and they can really get shuffled to the back in mm-hmm. terms of contractual priorities and things. And so it's a lot easier if you have a Ted Leonsis. Is that how you pronounce his name? Leonsis. Leonsis. Yeah. Leonsis. Leonsis. If you have Leonsis. a Ted Leonsis who um, owns the primary tenant of the Verizon Center, right? he can kind of stick up for the Arena League team in a way that like Gene Simmons can't. Right. Okay. And, so, and so there's the cost of renting these stadiums sometimes outweighs it's what yeah you know. it's enormous yeah it can be enormous it's all about butts and seats yep. at the end of the day yeah okay so there's interest there's interest from a lot of i'm assuming there's interest from a lot of you know people or owners out there in mm-hmm. the afl it's just the fact that they had to cut some they had to cut some owners out because of you know what yeah. they what they preferred yeah well, let I me think... give you an example give me an example of this um the LA Los Angeles has a has a developmental NBA t- developmental league team called the Defenders. Right now, they play at the Staples Center in Los Angeles, um, which is a part of the LA Live Complex, which is a multi billion dollar complex. That arena has the Lakers, the Clippers, and the Kings, a- and the WNBA team is a you know sort of the second minor league. There are three major sports teams right. in that arena, and the Defenders games the defenders get the absolute scraps in terms of scheduling and everything else. <laughs> it, th- that's the problem. Whereas, you know, if you have Leonsis, well, you know, in, in the Verizon center, it's a little bit easier uh, for him to get some priority scheduling and a better deal. Right. You know, okay. then you're talking about negotiating with Ann Schultz entertainment for, you know, with the Lakers. Right. And I, I also think that now everything's on the East Coast. That's probably going to make it logistically easier for the AFL. Why I don't watch the AFL on well, a regular basis. Yeah. But, you know, I, and I wrote about that too in my article how yeah. if you're going coast to coast and you're a minor league, that can be really tough financially. You know, plane tickets cost money. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, anyway. I you know I really enjoyed my time at the game. I'll be going all year. I hope other people uh, get into this. I know some people are since fifteen thousand people showed up. Um, yeah, I'm but, a fan. I'll watch. The, I'll watch some more games. Yeah, it, it's a. It's I plan on trying time. to go to some this summer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, honey, it, with five games, how many how many uh, weeks on the schedule? Uh, fourteen week season. 
Okay, cool. All right, well, fortunately, I'll, I'll Jamal, you know us. You know a season ticket holder who made. Yeah, I know. A, you I know a specific t- ticket holder that we're <laughs> having a conversation with right now. So, <laughs> right, if right. anything, <laughs> there's, if anything, I'll let him know in advance. Yeah, you can always just drop me a line, and I am planning on giving away at least one week's worth of tickets to some of our fans. I got to figure out which week, but. Uh, we look have out to figure for that. out a contest. Yeah, we'll we'll. I don't know how we'll do a contest, but we'll figure out something. The contest may be who's ever willing to pay us the most money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. World I'm joking. Contest. <laughs> <laughs> that would not be a contest. That would be a sale. Right. And so I'm just kidding about. We'll See have some no contest sort of, to me. Yeah. We'll have some some sort of giveaway type thing with these tickets. I'm thinking of a number between one and a hundred. Can you guess it or get close? <laughs> <laughs> like All that. right. So that should do it for this week's episode of the Hogsty. Stick with us uh, throughout the off season. Uh, you know, draft is coming up, everybody. It's this month, which is exciting. Um, so sure. stick stick here. We'll be talking all about the upcoming draft prospects, and of course, the day itself. We'll be talking about who the Redskins pick um, and how good their mustaches are, <laughs> and how good their mustaches are. We demand more mustaches in the Redskins locker room. <laughs> <laughs> Keep checking us out on thehogside.com. Have a good night, everyone. And on ins- and on Instagram now. Oh yeah, I threw us on Instagram. Oh yeah, fun. Steve did that, huh? No, I, I didn't. didn't. I don't know how to do it. Are you kidding me? Oh, okay, all right. Well, I I, I assumed the wrong person. <laughs> no, yeah, no, 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 I don't do. It's no. just me. Okay, <laughs> okay Alex. Credit to Alex. Then. Yeah. All right. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs>